Hi friends, I'm Clark Wolf and you're watching The Pop Fix. You guys know me by now. I'm the gal who's all about glasses, nautical stripes, and horror. And as we've discussed before in the case of paranormal activity, horror often gets a bad rap, whether it's slow burn or slasher, ghosts or gore. Today I invited my friend Jill Kill onto The Pop Fix to discuss with me the worst things I read about horror movies. Can't even the classics catch a break? Spoiler alert, not likely. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to slip into something more horrible. Welcome to the Pop Fix, Jill Kill. Thank you, Clark. Hello, Darklings. How do you like my new outfit? I, I love your new outfit. Yeah? Very gothy. I think it's working for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Jill Kill, I brought you here today to help refute some nasty reviews of some of the horror's best known classics, starting with the granddaddy of modern horror cinema, F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu, A Symphony of Terror. Now, the German classic is lauded for its creepy atmosphere and terrifying imagery, and the film was even the subject of an excellent movie, if I do say so myself, Shadow of the Vampire. But would you believe that way back in 1929, the New York Times tore Nosferatu apart, saying, The backgrounds are often quite effective, but most of it seems like cardboard puppets doing all they can to be horrible on paper mache settings. Mordaunt Hall went on to say that the chief figure in this orgy of goose flesh is Count Nosferatu, played by Max Schreck, of whom Hall was also not too fond, as he named the actor's movements as Orlock too deliberate to be lifelike. Jill, your thoughts? Um, I mean, it is an old black and white film, so it's kind of hard to judge by today's standards, but critics don't really know what they're talking about a lot of time, and some things are ahead of their time, and I'd say F.W. Murnau was one of those people. That man was not feeling it. That was in the olden times. That was like <laughs> Depression era. How about Rosemary's Baby? A new classic, Roman Polanski's adaptation of the Ira Levin novel is considered to be by most one of the top five best horror films ever made. Mm -hmm. Not so, according to Renata Adler, who begins her 1968 review by saying, it's a horror film, not very scary. Adler goes on to call the movie Pleasant. Pleasant. Clark, what do you think? I, Rosemary's Baby is a pleasant? Yes, it's the most pleasant movie about satanic cults and devil rape that I've ever seen. Well, Adler goes on to conclude that it doesn't quite work on any of its dark or powerful terms. She also says the movie is almost too extremely plausible. Plausible? Pl Rosemary's Baby is plausible. <laughs> I don't know if you could have babies with hooves necessarily in real life. I hope not. You could have really weird neighbors like that, though. She also mentions, one gets very annoyed that they don't catch on sooner. One's friends would have understood the situation at once. That's like one of those things, you can't say that about a horror movie. You can't say, like, people would just believe you that you're having a Satan baby. Isn't that the point of the movie? That is a point. That she's isolated from everyone? I don't think that woman watched Rosemary's Baby. No, I don't know. And of course, The Exorcist, William Friedkin's horror masterpiece that was nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. And of course, received all kinds of flack from the Catholic Church, obvi. And what about critically? Here comes the New York Times again. This time, it's Vincent Canby, notorious film critic who famously also wasn't into Rocky, The Empire Strikes Back, Night of the Living Dead, Blazing Saddles, A Christmas Story, Rain Man, and Alien. This guy has no taste. I know, right? What's up with him? <laughs> what does he like? That's my question. Canby called The Exorcist an elegant occultist claptrap. I don't use that word enough. <laughs> Let's all bring back Claptrap. Right now, hashtag Claptrap. <laughs> has, hashtag Horror Claptrap. He also doesn't like the visual effects, saying The Exorcist establishes a new low for grotesque special effects, and notes that Friedkin and screenwriter Blatty, who won an Oscar for the script, by the way, would try any trick to get the audience to escape boredom and sh by shock and insult. I just don't understand how you can watch The Exorcist and say it's not a good movie. I, Are you not a fan? I love The Exorcist, but I can see how maybe I don't know. I think sometimes reviewers like to just say mean things so they can get attention. Plus, that guy doesn't like anything. Jill, next up is The Shining, which is one of your favorites, Absolutely. I know. And believe it or not, the New York Times actually gave Stanley Kubrick's Stephen King adaptation a positive review. Good. With a delightfully backhanded title that reads, Flaws Don't Dim The Shining. So clever. So clever. <laughs> Critic Janet Maslin explains, scaring the viewer is easy. A hack job like Friday the 13th is probably scarier than The Shining, which I need to stop right here. Scaring the audience is easy. Jill? I don't think it's necessarily easy. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily easy either because if it were easy, we'd have a greater number of better horror movies. Anyway. She also says that not since Lolita or Dr. Strangelove has he made a film with such humanity or humor. 
I, I don't think that um, The Shining is his most humane movie, especially <laughs> considering what Kubrick put uh, Shelley Duvall through during the filming of it. I don't think that the humanity in The Shining is, is what makes it so great. No. no, it's about the cold, brutal. It's basically about insanity. the lack of humanity. Yes. <laughs> that makes The Shining, but you know. I actually read a quote from David Cronenberg where he said that Kubrick didn't know how to scare people, probably because he doesn't understand them. Which Cronenberg I, is biting off more than he can chew right know, there. But I want to throw a little Cosmopolis back in his face. I Absolutely, throw that right in his face. Right back in the face. <laughs> De Palma also called The Shining heavy-handed. Brian De Palma needs to stop. I mean, actually, Brian De Palma did stop, so it's fine. That touche. <laughs> this is by far, this is the worst one. This is the one that kills me. It kills me. So our friend Vincent Canby is back. He's not our friend. No, he is not our <laughs> friend. He is not anyone's friend. The guy that doesn't like Star Wars or Rocky and thought the Exorcist special effects were ridiculous is back on behalf of the New York Times. I bet he loved The Thing. No. No, he definitely didn't. John Carpenter's The Thing is a foolish, depressing, overproduced movie that mixes horror with science fiction to make something that is fun as neither one thing or the other. Sometimes it looks as if he aspired to be the quintessential moron movie of the 80s. A virtually storyless feature composed of lots of laboratory concocted special effects. He's killing me with the actors used merely as props to be hacked, slashed, disemboweled, and decapitated. Finally, to be eaten and then regurgitated as, guess what? More laboratory concocted special effects. It's so brutal. That Vincent can be a, he, a mess. He, he continues. Because I know you didn't want to read this. It hurts her too much. <laughs> <laughs> there may be a metaphor in all of this, but I doubt it. I don't know if this Vincent can be. He also goes on to say, the Hawks film, because John Carpenter's The Thing is a remake of the Howard Hawks film. The Hawks film is something of a masterpiece of understatement. It's also funny. The new thing has been written with no great style by Bill Lancaster and directed by Mr. Carpenter without apparent energy. What? Or the ability to share his interest with us. The Thing, which opens today, is too phony looking to be disgusting. It qualifies only as instant junk. This guy knows nothing. First off, The Thing is a masterpiece. It is John a Carpenter's masterpiece. Thing it is, is a horror masterpiece. Absolute masterpiece. Yes, it wasn't recognized as such when it came out. It came out the same weekend as Blade Runner, and both movies flopped. So that just shows how much people knew in 1982. Even worse, The Thing sits at a 17% fresh rating on the top critics' Rotten Tomato meter. Out of Variety, Time Out, Roger Ebert at the Chicago Sun-Times, and the New York Times, of course, none of them gave The Thing a positive review. I feel like usually there's one one critic somewhere. One visionary. One person <laughs> that gets it, and you know, you all look back and you go, ah, oh, they, they got it right. This one nobody got. Carpenter was ahead of his time. He was ahead of his time, but how is it even possible? Here's what I want to know. If we asked the critics now if they would have changed their mind. Like, it seems... I think Roger Ebert usually changes his mind in retrospect. He comes back to it. I wonder if he did a re-review. We should look it up. We should look it up. Okay, friends, tell us what you think. Are critics extra harsh on horror films, or are they just a bunch of junk? Let us know in the comments below. A very special thank you to our guest, Miss Jill Kill. Jill, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Gothic Clark. Oh, I learned from the best. <laughs> And don't forget to subscribe to The Pop Fix. And Ms. Jill Kill, where can everybody find you on the internet? You can find me at the Jill Kill on YouTube, or you can look me up because it's jillkill.com. It's that easy. Jillkill.com. I'm Clark Wolf, and until next time, what's your fix?